Uh, but I want to just say um, something about the relationship that we've entered into here between Trinity School for Ministry and the North American Lutheran Seminary, which is here in our midst. And the story begins with the North American Lutheran Church as they were becoming established, coming out from the Evangelical Lutheran Church and looking for a seminary. They were looking at a number of potential seminaries and Trinity was one of them. So they were saying to us, are you interested in entering into such a relationship? So the question for us at that time was, well, how do you answer that kind of question? And I think this is, uh, for me, one of the places where having things like a vision, purpose, values, these things really come into play. If you know what you're trying to achieve, if you know how you're trying to go about it, if you know what your values are, you go to those things. So, well, would it be true to Trinity to say yes to a potential partnership like that? So there's a place like that where we remember we are an evangelical seminary in the Anglican tradition. That's right there in the heart of our the beginning of our vision statement, kind of really a position statement. That's who we are. And so we can say to a group who say, we're interested in you know, getting to know you better, perhaps forming a partnership, say, well, here's where we are. Does that attract you or repel you? Would you like to be you know, sitting amongst people like this? They say yes or no. So that's helpful to us. Also in our second value, um, we welcome students and faculty who long for a church that is evangelical in faith, Catholic in order, alive in the Holy Spirit, committed to mission. We have a vital commitment to students from the Episcopal Church and from other Anglican jurisdictions, both in North America and beyond. We also welcome students from other Christian traditions. Hey, we wrote that years ago, <laughs> you know, before this question came up. So again, we go back to these kind of shaping, guiding documents and we find, yes, affirmation there. This is the kind of thing that we would expect to be open to. It's also important, as uh, Phil and David, actually, in different ways, were both reminding us, Lutheranism and Anglicanism have had lots of connections down the years. And clearly, for, for Cranmer, Archbishop Cranmer, that connection with Luther and Lutheranism, with particularly Lutheranism, has an enormous impact on the founding of the Anglican movement. And here we are in Evangelical Seminary, in the Anglican tradition. We want to hold high that reformation of the Catholic Church in England that gave us Anglicanism. So you know what? Lutherans and us, we've got a whole lot in common already. So again, it's, it's an affirmation of our own character, our own uh, particular ethos, our own vision. So it's not a sort of compromise. It's an affirmation of things which we are already committed to. Uh, we are evangelical. We're reformational. We love these things. And so another movement with similar aspirations is a natural affinity for us. Also to say, it does, uh, again, affirm this ecumenical vision. I understand Anglicanism as a giant exercise in ecumenism. Extraordinary one. Talk about weirdness. I mean, we are able to hold together Catholicism and Reformation in a remarkably dynamic way. The reformation, reformation of the Catholic Church is Anglicanism. So you've got some who would say we identify much more on the Catholic end. Others are much more identifying at the Reformation, a slightly more evangelical end perhaps, and a whole bunch of folks in between. So there's something about that which is complicated, but it has itself an ecumenical vision. There's a generosity of spirit about it, a generous orthodoxy. We don't want to just say we've got a narrowly defined set of criteria which determine what we think Christianity looks like. It's a much more generous and open-handed approach. But also, of course, okay, so we're beginning to think this relationship might be coming our way. What if they said, yes, they would like to come settle here at Trinity? Well, then we're going to start having a question with our faculty. Our faculty play a leading role in maintaining the vision and life of this school. And so we were able to say, as the conversations continued, we were able to bring something to, to the faculty. Does this look to you like a good a match, a good friendship, a good partnership. And then it goes to the whole board of trustees. What do you think? Does this look like a good friendship, a good match, a good partnership? And at each time, the answer was yes. It looks like a very good match. But again, this is all a sort of discernment process. And to trust that God is in it, that we're trying to follow the Lord's leading, to go back to that church missionary society principle, and really allow the Lord to lead us stage by stage. It also, I think, makes good uh, use of resources. We have a wonderful provision here, a wonderful faculty, a wonderful library, a great campus. All these things are blessings that God has given us. And if we can share them and use them wisely without in any way compromising what we're doing, that makes a whole lot of sense. It also seems to me, in terms of the importance for the life of the church, we do live at a time of substantial uh, changes on the way in the life of the church. This is, I mean, you, you, you know... You, d you must have noticed. <laughs> There's a whole lot going on out there. I'm not going to give you the full story, but this is a time of realignment in all sorts of ways. But just as there are, if you like, realignments within traditions, we're also finding reconnections across traditions. And I think that's a very exciting thing about this day. Obviously, it's a very painful day to be a Christian person. There's lots to be embarrassed about. Read the news, read the blogs. If you're not feeling sufficiently embarrassed, we can point you where to look. 
terrible things going on. We, we are humiliating ourselves before a watching world, and that is a painful thing. But if within all this realignment, there is actually also a reconnection taking place. I, for one, want to celebrate that. I think that's a very exciting thing and a pleasing thing. Um, we remember, of course, Jesus' own prayer that the church may be one. That's what we want to see. We want it one around the gospel, around the word of God, around Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. It's also worth saying that there are other conversations. We are continuing a conversation at the moment with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. A number of you here are Evangelical Presbyterians. Are the Presbyterians also? So we are also in a similar kind of conversation at the moment with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. So one of the things we were looking at at the last board meeting, having already talked about it as a faculty, is not only having a, a Master of Divinity degree Lutheran track or Lutheran focus, Master of Divinity degree Presbyterian track, Presbyterian focus. And again, that seems to me a similar way affirming what we are already committed to as uh, an evangelical seminary in the Anglican tradition. It's another, uh, another movement with very similar aspirations. And just as we were being reminded by Phil a few moments ago, in the early years of, for the, the Reformation that uh, was coming through to England through people like Archbishop Cranmer, there was a strongly Lutheran uh, emphasis. The next phase was a more Calvinistic one, a more refor uh, reformed one, as we'd now call it. So again, this is another way of saying this would also, I think, reinforce our vision and our values. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to end up with you know, 25 different tracks for every potential um, uh, partner. The only other one which would, I think, make immediate sense to me would be the Methodists. But we know that the Methodists are not looking for people like us. They've, they've got their own commitment to their own Methodist seminaries. I applaud them for it. But I don't want to... I think the thing is, as we, as we do these kind of things, you might well be thinking, well, who are we going to be partnering with next? I quite, my own view is, you know, that's an exciting thought, but it could be daunting. We want to make sure that when we enter into a conversation about a potential partnership, it's a reinforcement and not a dilution. So these are the questions that we think about as we enter into these conversations. And we need to make sure that as we have a relationship like this unfolding, that we have open conversations like this. Again, you may find yourself managing change in the future. Don't be surprised. <laughs> so having open conversations. When people don't know what's going on, they fear the worst. And even if things are bad, they think it's even worse. <laughs> things are not bad. Things are actually genuinely good in this situation. But I think to be open about it, that's why I want to make sure we stop now and get a chance for questions. Um, and to keep those conversations going. We're, go we're learning how to do this. We've been in touch with other seminaries who've done similar things. There's a Lutheran seminary that's taken the Anglicans in. Uh, we've been in conversation uh, with them. Similarities and differences there which we can learn from each other. Um, but to be sure again, that what you're doing in a partnership like this reinforces the vision, the purpose, the values. Those things are really guiding principles that take a, any organization forward. Um, and to, to notice the, the importance of structuring these things well, we, it's important to us that the, our, our new two uh, colleagues and the faculty are fully members of our faculty. There's not a separate faculty with separate faculty meetings. We meet together. The Farah is a full member of our staff. These things are really important. We want to have a genuine integration as well as maintaining distinctiveness, as you have with a leadership formation group, particularly with the Lutheran focus. So these things are all part of trying to actually set in place patterns for the future. At the seminary I went to, we had a Methodist school within the Anglican school. So we saw how that worked out. And again, there are challenges with all these things. There will be challenges. We don't deny that. These are, I think, proper gospel challenges, though. How do we actually live together, even with points of difference in front of us? So I want to commend those to you and, uh, and to ask that you continue to pray as we work these things out and that we uh, do these things well and for the glory of the Lord. So let's just uh, stop there. I'm going to take questions. There is, I think, a microphone <coughs> is available for you. So if you have a question, if you'd raise a hand, and if you could wait for the microphone to be in your hand before you raise your question, and you have a panel of three of us who will be willing to take any questions that you may have. Or we can go straight to the leadership formation groups right now. <laughs> Poppy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think probably on a, a practical level, if there could be some explanation of who can take what classes and why certain people can and cannot, and um, what does that work for strange non denoms like me who aren't any track and uh, <laughs> love all? So. <laughs> if I start that off, others may want to come in. Um, but the first thing to say is, one of the things that I've enjoyed about this, and the things that particularly I want to ad admire the Lutherans for, is they, we're going to do 10 distinctively Lutheran classes. I applaud that. These are great traditions. And we want to make sure that there are the graduates who graduate, whether it's Anglicans or Lutherans or Presbyterians or whatever else they may be, go out with a genuine appreciation of their own tradition, as well as hopefully some admiration and perhaps reservation about the others. So that's what we're trying to do here. 
Um, so I think what we're trying to say is if you sign up for a Master of Divinity degree here, which is presumably what you're referring to, the Master of Arts and Religion, there's loads of options there. So I guess you're more thinking about the Master of Divinity. What we want to be able to say is if you're signing up, you're coming here as a Lutheran, there is a set of classes that make sense together. They reinforce each other. Now, if you want to take an elective from another class, from another tradition, you're welcome to do so. But what we want to do is really present a coherent set of classes that reinforce themselves. That's the goal of it. And so, uh, likewise, we've made sure that the standard MDiv has a distinctive, you know, evangelical Anglican commitments within it, but again, uh, hopefully a generosity to those of other traditions, which we think is both evangelical and Anglican. So these things, I hope, I think just reinforce again what we're, what we're talking about. But the goal is to have uh, a coherence and integrity uh, from which you can then take classes from elsewhere, but as electives. Uh, one practical point is that um, the two tracks don't necessarily uh, um, are not, what's the word I'm looking for? They, um, they're not necessarily in sync with one another. Um, in the Lutheran track, I teach a course called Creeds and Catechisms and a course on the Lutheran Confessions and then Theology 1 and 2. In the Anglican track, you have um, an Anglicanism course and then three session, three introductory theology courses. So you can't mix and match those because they, um, because it's a different track. So that's one reason why, not the only reason, but one reason why you have to either be for these theology courses on the Lutheran track or the Anglican track. You, uh, you can't mix them and match them because they don't match. <laughs>Just wondering if you could speak to why the leadership formation groups have been distinct and separated. Sure. Well, I'll start that one off again. If Amy or David or other wants to come in, please do. I think part of the thinking is how do you, again, form a community of people who have got a genuine relationship of strength and depth together and yet are also part of a wider student body? And so I've seen this in the school that I went to. We had Methodists living with Anglicans and it's also you know, Anglicans living with Lutherans. I mean, these things can be done <laughs> in different settings. But I think part of it is um, that there is a sense in which you want to have a chance to those to for those to come together who are training for a similar tradition, to serve in this case in the Lutheran tradition. Uh, also, I think it makes sense when you talk about the week in chapel. It makes sense if we can have a more uh, Lutheran-focused week and you've got the Lutherans working together in preparation for that week. So I think that, that's, that's the strength of it in, in my mind. I'd want to say about that too that um, it's kind of a judgment call about how best to do it. But it is, um, I think, not a bad thing at least, maybe not the best thing. We could argue about it, I think. But it's not a bad thing for the Lutheran students to have a place where they can sort of debrief. Yeah. I mean, we're, com we're all of us coming out of these ructions in our, in our traditions. Um, so we've all got these questions about who we are uh, floating around. Plus, we have, um, in the case of the Lutherans, then, then they're also very appreciatively. I think every, I've heard nothing bad about it, but there are kind of, how, how do I put all this together in forming an identity as a Lutheran pastor? So that's not a bad thing to have. Maybe we need to think of ways in which Anglican and Lutheran students can interact in similar fashion, and I, I would be all for that. Anyone with bright ideas, please see him or Amy. <laughs> Just... Also, to just remind everybody that uh, being uh, liturgical traditions, both of them, it's important to realize that our, uh, the ethos in each is not just carried by the formal language of the liturgy, but also by uh, the uh, implicit or dispositional kind of consciousness of that tradition that's uh, often shared more through expressions of feeling and sentiment and in the realm of what we might call piety. And we wouldn't want Lutheran students to be denied the opportunity to practice the language and to experience the subjectivity and dispositional aspect of what it means to be Lutheran. And that happens very effectively in a more informal atmosphere outside of the classroom where Lutherans can learn what it is to pray together uh, and share with one another, and they're actually in some ways rehearsing a kind of language that's both explicit and implicit in that. The f hopefully, in doing that, that does not mean that Lutherans then become, like Anglicans would be in their groups, 
uh, exclusive of one another, unable to comprehend one another. And that's why we still have common worship and uh, also all kinds of other more uh, spontaneous opportunities for us to share and experience that piety, that realm of subjective appropriation of these great traditions uh, as well. So it, it, it's, it's all part of the package. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to deny that to anyone. I will say too about, um, just about worship. Um, in the current situation, Lutheran students are worshiping and Lutheran faculty, according to the Book of Common Prayer, 12 weeks out of 13 of the semester. Um, and then in the beginning of December, we'll have a week where we do Lutheran services. And I appreciate your uh, grace in putting up with us. Um, <laughs> for to do that, it will be a, a chance for you to um, see how another liturgical tradition does things that's both the same and different. Uh, you may learn something about being an Anglican from that experience. Um, I'm very happy that we are, that our students for the minister are having the experience of daily prayer book worship. I think it's a deep and formative thing, and I love the prayer book. I, I honor the prayer book as one of the great Christian liturgies. Um, but we do need some places for the Lutherans to learn to do, um, to operate within their own tradition as well. If I could add one piece to that. Is the mic on, right? Okay. So um, one thing that we don't think of around here in a daily sense is that the North American Lutheran Seminary is a dispersed seminary. That this is our seminary center, but we have a house of studies in Charlotte. And we also uh, nationwide have about 45 or 50 NALC students who are dispersed at a variety of seminaries who started their programs before we were established. And one of the things that's at least in my experience, important in the life of Lutheran pastors is to understand that you're part of a ministerium, um, that these relationships are going to go on um, and on. It's not that you don't have all sorts of ecumenical friends, but you're going to be meeting with these same people maybe 40 or 50 years. And so that there's a core that's established within that disbursement. Um, our students have a, an opportunity of an annual uh, summer retreat at our convocation when if they're all free, they can all come in, but they all they can't always. So this is one of the few places that um, there's this uh, group uh, together. Um, hopefully, in some of the January and June term classes, some of those other 40 um, are going to be coming in, and we have that opportunity to meet. But we're really we're a young church body and dispersed, and so having that uh, little sense of community within the wider community, I think, is helpful in the creation of a ministerium. Time for one more question. I think Paul's, Paul's hand was up first. Uh, well, it's sort of two parts. One is, uh, so if we did have a partnership with the uh, uh, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, would they also have their own groups? And how do you keep the, ten how do you navigate that tension of um, distinct and yet cooperative? And then paired with that, so um, in keeping tracks or creating tracks, uh, What's being done to um, wrestle with the tension of, so how do we practice our commonality? So uh, two, two places that I would ask, like uh, homiletics and ethics, are those classes that um, we could say, here's enough commonality to, to practice together? Or you know, how, do you, how are you navigating that? Yeah, well, just sort of with the uh, question about the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, it is similar in, but different. I mean, the, one of the differences is there's a lot of Evangelical Presbyterians around this area. So they wouldn't necessarily need to have any uh, full-time faculty join us. There's lots of potential adjunct faculty around. Rich Herbster is already one of our regular adjunct faculty. Well, he is an Evangelical Presbyterian pastor. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's different in that respect. But what they want to be able to do is make sure that if, if they're going to have more, I mean, we've already got a number, but if we're to have more Evangelical Presbyterians come here to make sure they are getting their own distinctive traditions properly represented. Um, but um, and I, you know, I don't know yet. We haven't got to the question about whether we'd have a separate leadership formation group. Good question. We haven't got there yet. Have you already got an answer to that, Amy? Do you need the mic? Look, on. Thank you. We may not always have that. It depends on how many Lutherans and how many faculty. And you know, I could argue both sides of it. Um, I think it was a good thing for us to do that now. I don't know if you know five years down the road that's going to be the best thing to do. Now the yeah. advisor for all the Lutheran students. Right. If we get 30, that's right. going to be a little rough. Right. <laughs> that's just what I was thinking. But, but, see, but, but part of the value of having these conversations is you're helping us to think things through. You're giving us some, some of the wisdom. You are a group of leaders, you know. So that adds to it. 
Um, the other question, though, you're raising about Lutheran, so the, the um, homiletics class. Uh, it may well be for the Presbyterians, that the, the one that the Peter teaches will work very well uh, for Presbyterians as well as those who already take that class. There are particular traditions of homiletics that are true for Lutherans. They have their own distinctive homiletic tradition. Um, so that would be a case in point. I don't know about the ethics class. I mean, there was always a possibility of, of you know, taking each other's classes. But I think the thing, the thing I've become clearer about in many ways over these last years is you want to have integrity to your tradition. And that's no mark of disrespect to anybody else's tradition. But if you're going to be especially in ordained ministry in a tradition, it's a great idea to know about your tradition. It really is. You, know, you want to know about your history, your, your theology, your, your ethics, you know, your preaching style. Um, and I think that's been part of the thinking that the Lutherans have brought to us. We really do want to have Lutherans graduate and not sort of Anglo-Lutherans, whatever that might be. You know, we could actually end up generating new denominations. Well, I don't think we want that. You know? So I want to you know, affirm what I think has been a good conversation getting us to this point, but to allow the genuine distinctiveness of, of a tradition and yet set in an ecumenical context so you don't go away thinking, you know what, I, am, I alone am right. You know? <laughs> there may be others out there who've got a perfectly good reason for doing something different. Yeah, did Phil? Um, yeah, it, it, what, what happens is that when, you, uh, when you're at a school like Trinity that does r understand what a tradition is in, in practical uh, ways as well as more refined, uh, theologically defined ways, when, you, when you're in a situation like this, what's happening is, folks, is that you are being formed in your tradition or in something more than being sustained in your tradition, but you're in close proximity to another great tradition, and that makes you more critically self-aware of your own, and hopefully because of the fact that we are in this together, uh, you will own your identity. You will practice your Anglican ethos or your Lutheran ethos with much greater humility, and you will be poised so much more intellectually and uh, morally, spiritually, to uh, uh, abide by Christ's second great commission, which is to be one as he and the Father are one. All right, that's, that's really, I think, the ultimate goal of this. We all hold these traditions on the pilgrimage, as Luther said. These traditions are not uh, etched in uh, heaven's uh, kind of uh, streets for, for our ultimate future and eternal identity. They are provisional. Uh, can I share a quote from Oliver O'Donovan? And maybe this could be a closing, but I'd love to hear David talk about it. And if he and I have to, we're going to meet over a beer to make sure that <laughs> he tells me if he thinks this is just Anglican hubris or Ang Anglican humility. It's from Oliver O'Donovan. He says, Anglicanism has, in its genius, never been one of growing its own theological nourishment, but only to pre by preparing what was provided from elsewhere and to set it decently on the table. And from what I've heard from David tonight, or this morning, it feels like tonight right now. <laughs> what I heard from David uh, and, uh, is that actually that's true for Lutherans as well. They borrowed from us quite a lot as well. But we are both pretty good at setting it decently on the order, uh, orderly on the table. And maybe we have, as he said, a little bit of an edge on that. But sometimes we do, as he said, perhaps get so preoccupied with our orderliness that we have forgot to be weird. <laughs> I wanted to say just a brief word about the ethics course. The reason we have a Lutheran ethics course is not because the Lutherans have this great, strong, distinctive tradition in ethics. It's because we're really bad at it. Um, our debates in our version of the same debates that we've all had about sexual morality and so forth mostly displayed for us that Lutherans don't know how to start thinking about ethics. Um, that's because of ways that the law gospel distinction has been handled in the last hundred years in modernist Lutheran theology and so forth. So we really need a distinctive Lutheran ethics course because we don't know how to, we need to start more primitively there probably than other people do. We need to start with basics and we need to think how in fact you can be Lutheran and have ethics. <laughs> I know I'm going to bring it to a close there. As you can see, we've got plenty more to talk about here. But we're still together, so we can carry on the conversations. Let me just say a prayer. We need to be able to go to our leadership formation groups. Father God, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for friendships, especially new friendships discovered. We thank you for this great privilege of having the North American Lutheran Seminary here at Trinity. We pray you'd bless and prosper this work. We believe it's you that's led us into it, and we pray you'd guide us through it. Let it be a blessing to all involved. Give us wisdom, Lord, that we may do these things well and to your glory, through Christ our Lord.
Amen.